I'm joined by some stalwarts of Whitburn Band this evening. I have John Lambie, Bobby Henry, Alec Vidler, and Jimmy Graham. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. Can we just first start with you, John, and tell us when you first became involved as a member of Whitburn Band? Well, I joined the band when I was 10. That was in 1952. And uh, I've enjoyed my banding from then. Excellent. All the way through. Bobby? I joined the band in the late 50s. I was eight years old. Uh, it's been a marvellous, marvellous experience. Um, it's also great at that age because it kept you off the streets. <laughs> Alec? I joined the band when I was 11 years age, so that would be 1960. And uh, the experience of being in the band all that time has been a, a hobby that's lasted a lifetime and it's been fantastic. Jimmy. Well, uh, I'm like an odd man out here. <laughs> Firstly, I'm not a football guy at birth. The first time I joined the band, I was in the army, I believe, on that station, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in Redford Barracks in Edinburgh. And uh, I heard the band, of, we were actually down in London, uh, playing the Buckingham Palace Guards Mountain. And uh, I heard the band on the radio, and they just had purchased a new set of low pitch instruments. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, well, look, there's no far from Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So in 19, late 65, I came along and that was my first experience. And I was there until 67 when I got demobbed and went back home to Del Mellington. Del Mellington, that's right. So a wide experience uh, of the band in the years of the members we have here this evening. Uh, I'm opening it up now to a group discussion. What was the band like in the early days when you first remember playing? What type of music did you play? What type of events, gigs did you play at? Well, the first gigs that we I played at when I got into the senior band was gala days. And then you were promoted to, uh, once you got to concerts, mm -hmm. and you were sort of chaperoned by your, your peers. Uh, it was good fun. We used to do a lot of park engagements in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and I think we did about every gala day in West Lothian. So <laughs> it was quite a busy time during June and July and August when, when the band was busy in the summer time, and it was also revenue for the band. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember we used to go down to Silver House, the bandstand at Silver House, yeah, yeah. and uh, as Alex says, Predominantly, it was gala day work and contests, of course. We had our miners gala. We had also, obviously, the Scottish to play it, and we had the uh, Glasgow charities, Glasgow charities, five Edinburgh Edinburgh charities, Edinburgh charities. So we had five charities. Yeah, yeah. So the band were busy. Busy. Yeah. Music wise, then there wasn't a big scope of brass banding, but most of the stuff that we played was um, adopted from orchestral work. Yeah. But some of it was very good at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, it's progressed obviously over the years to go to better stuff now when they're doing special pieces of music for brass banding. Original pieces. Yes. Yeah. And what about the that first that the kind of early days when the band first arrived into the championship section and won their first championship section title, which was in 1968? I know that Alec and John, you were in that performance. Can you tell us what the lead up was like to that? What the test piece was, what Alec Fleming, the conductor, was like, and what the actual performance itself was. What do you remember from that day? Well, it was uh, obviously 1968, and Alex Fleming, the conductor, he actually took two bands that day, Kirk and Dillard Band and Whitburn Band. Right. And uh, he based the interpretation uh, it was uh, Beethoven's Eighth Symphony, and he based it on uh, lighter music. And our premier band at that time was uh, CWS Glasgow, who played it up loud, and it just wasn't to be for the adjudicator on the day, who was a, I think he was a piano player, piano player, uh, Atkinson, if I remember right. Yeah, the same. adjudicator. This, this band that won today, the band that played it in the 18th century style right. in Lanark. That's right. And that's what won them contest today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the, then the band, could, the band that couldn't even afford the bus to go to boat, which was just down the road. We all waiting cars or whatever, you know. And uh, it was 
well, a happy occasion when we come back for that. Nobody had ever won the championship before, so it was the first time for I was nearly everyone, maybe bar John Brown, the principal corner player at the time. I think everybody else never had won the championship. Well, not the, the championship section anyway. And what was it like coming back to the town with that that title? Oh, I, it was tremendous. The community. It was a uh, much celebration <laughs> in the band room that night. Not a lot of. Aye. Can imagine. Aye, it was good, and it, it was quite good in the fact that the uh, Alex Fleming taking the two bands and we managed to beat the other band, you know. So, aye, it was happy days. So it was his interpretation. That brought us My first memory of winning a contest was the second section. Mm -hmm. And there was members in the band had never ever won a contest in their puff before. And it was a great experience for them for too. Prior to us was the, when the, the, the band, the Whitman Miners Welfare Band won in London. 1954. 1954 with Herbert Kaisley. The piece was... Glastonbury. Glastonbury, that's yeah. right. Uh, Again, in their days, that, they were a third section band, but they went to the Edinburgh, Prince of Princess Street Gardens, and beat championship section mm -hmm. bands, that same band that won in London. Yeah, so the band was on good form from middle to late 50s, working up to eventually that, that first victory in 1968. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And after that, obviously, lots more success. Uh, came through the 60s into the 70s, and then in 1979 was the arrival of one major Peter Parks, who is I still cast upon us on the wall there as you come in the band room door. He is a legend of brass banding, a legend of a conductor, a legend of a man. Uh, I don't think there's any dispute there at all. What was he like as a man and a musician, and what did he bring to the band? Total magic. Hmm. It was a marvellous experience what he brought to this band. Mm -hmm. We went from there to there with that fella. He made yeah. himself believe in herself. Yeah. Correct. That when you went to a contest, <coughs> you actually believed you were going to win. You had practiced that much. And uh, he, he more or less he, he sort of browbeated you in a way, in a nice way, in the band room, and you were actually glad to get on the stage and play for him. So that's the kind of, yes, very inspirational. Yeah. Uh, very inspirational. When he was on the stage, you really wanted to play for the man. And you dreaded letting him do, and you would never have let him do. Mm -hmm. You made sure you did your damnedest. Yeah. He was a sticker for time, being here mm -hmm. in time. Uh -huh. And if you come to the you were late, hey, why are you? I've travelled all the way from, so yeah. why are you here? Things like that. So his, his manner, even in the rehearsals, for timekeeping and that led on to then the playing and the discipline and the music and everything. Jim, you played well, as a principal player with the Major. I so I did for many years. So what, what's your my memory? impression of the Major was when we got a test piece out for the first time, right away he put his stamp on it mm -hmm. and that was it to the, mm -hmm. the platform. Yeah, so he had a clear defined oh, way of what he was going to do. He knew what he was doing, he knew what he wanted and he knew how to get it. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Well, he always done his homework before he oh, yeah. came into the band room. He was prepared oh, at all times. And did his reputation arrive before he did? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was at Dom Ellington. Mm -hmm. And, um, he was at <laughs> taking Dom Ellington uh, pageantry. And they drew number one, unfortunately. And uh, Peter Gray and my, myself had a blather with him prior to him going on the platform and there was just something about the guy. It was just an you know, an aura about him. Mm -hmm. that we brought it back to committee and uh, says to the committee we should request him. But, he, but the first thing the major pointed out to us was he had Del Mellington. And if Del Mellington asked him again that's what but they didn't so we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was that gentleman's, not gentleman's agreement, but you had that. Yes. That yes. the right way of doing things. Yes. Yeah, a gentleman. Uh, could I just say that my first experience at Major Parks, believe it or not, was in the military. 
when, of course, he was a military band. Leader, wasn't and he? Uh, it was uh, his first uh, uh, job as a commissioned officer was uh, in uh, Germany. We were playing at a big uh, tattoo for a Russian ambassador in Berlin. And the major was in charge of all the, the line bands and French bands, German bands and so on. That was my first day. Uh, that was in 1962. Mm -hmm. And was he involved in brass bands at that point? Uh, I think uh, latterly he started going to Black Day. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not 100% sure about yeah. that one. Uh -huh. Because he's certainly famous with Black Tide fans oh, and uh, right. his affiliation yeah. with um, that, and that's kind of you can yeah. look, you can look that one up. Mm -hmm. His first uh, piece with Black Dyke that he won me was Robert Byrne's Vida Matal. Oh, Vida Matal. I can't remember the exact date, but that was yeah. the first time we took them. And they had been. It was busy at Neller Hall at the time. Not as no. well. When he went to Black Dyke at first. He still was at Neller Hall. No, he was, uh, he was a director of the... Uh, Grenadier Guard. Grenadier Guard, I think it was. Was he not in line for that job at Neller Hall? I don't think so. I'm sure he told me that. No, <laughs> no that, that's another story. Well, certainly the um, the affiliation, or the association rather, between the conductor of Black Dyke and Whitburn Stoll mm -hmm. is uh, working today with mm -hmm. uh, the band's director of music, Professor Nicholas Childs, who has the major, as everyone does, up on the top shelf as not only a musician, but a man and a band leader. But of course, maybe not deliberately, but he did have a humorous side to him okay. in the way that he spoke to players or got his point across. And I know there's many stories that um, of, of times in rehearsals. So please tell us of some of these times where the major left that a mark on you from a comment or a way he said something. Well, I think the most famous one that I can remember it was a certain member of the band. Uh, the major asked him uh, what the Roland Tandem meant. And the, the player mm -hmm. would say, slow down, he said, no, 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 no. He said, what's the bloody beat? <laughs> <laughs> another one, another one was, uh, the, he was taking the band and there was a couple of lads come in for the cooperative band, be the rehearsal. This was an old band all down the road. And uh, we quietly whispered to the major at half time, you know, there are a couple of lads for the cooperative there. He says, you can teach a parrot to speak, but it doesn't know what it's saying. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a famous one, uh, one, one of the times there was uh, the soprano player, he was, he was telling them how to play a certain piece of music. And of course, there was a bit of dialogue between the two of them, how this was going, and the soprano player turned around to the major and says, well, major, I was just thinking there. He says, no, 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 you don't do the thinking. I'm paid to do that. You do the playing, I do the thinking. <laughs> such such <laughs> a way with words. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly there's many, many stories and many, many band rooms of his dry wit. Uh, but he, he, was a, he was a great guy. He had, very sociable, even after band rehearsals, he would go over to the pub and he would sit and have a, a chat with everybody. He became personal friends with everybody. Oh, else. everybody. Very much so. Very yeah. much so. Obviously, that's the best thing because he became friendly with everybody. Yeah. And other bands couldn't understand how the player was still with what band, not going with Land South and Vardar. Because mm -hmm. it was that good. Exactly. We had a great rapport with him. Oh. And special. Yeah. We'd come down to my house after rehearsal after we'd had a few beers and we would he would get his supper out of but the first thing he did when he came in he go straight through the room and take his shoes off and put his feet up on the couch. <laughs> 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 he just relaxed. And of course he was a phenomenal musician. Very much so. But, you know, first and foremost, and that's why he was conducting bands at this championship section level. Um, can you remember of a few performances within his time in here in the band? where not only you saw his ability to draw the music out of in a performance, or even his ability to um, get the most technical section of a piece absolutely nailed. I mean, how, how did you go about doing that? And can you remember moments, I'm sure we all know moments where we feel the music just come out of a piece. And I'm sure there's pieces that you did with him that that was the case. Well, there was one particular piece and it was uh, Images. I think that was McCabe's. Mm -hmm. 
And all the talk, we, we, we had the piece before the major came and we were rehearsing it on it. Nobody really liked the piece or anything like that. And uh, the principal corner player at the time was Archie Sutherland. And uh, the band were, they weren't too keen in the piece to say the least. And the, the word about all the other bands were saying, oh, what, what kind of music is this and all the rest of it. The very first rehearsal the major came up, it was a different piece. Mm -hmm. And when we played it at the Scottish Championships, it was totally different. You, the audience, and it was Mother Old Town Hall, and the audience just told you who was going to win that contest that day because the major was the only one that could get the music out of it to start to finish. Yeah. And he, he, he just made the piece a piece of music. It is phenomenal. It's the same as when your piece is, you'll learn to love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, this is it's only notes and paper. You you got to bring it off the page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. course, and there was many. I know um, people have talked about the legendary performances of Blitz uh, at the European with the major, and also in London um, as well. Um, so was that a one piece that you had quite a lot of affiliation with him when it came to do that? No, well, that's a fact. We we were Did introduced to Blitz with. Uh, Jeff Whitman. Jeff Whitman. Um, oh, it was Jeff Whitman in London and it was the major. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. That was my performance at as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was. Anytime we played that competitively, apart from London, we always won it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I remember uh, our dear friend and colleague Sam Knox telling me that London, as you mentioned, John, there was Blitz with Jeff Whitman and it was the 3rd of October. And you drew number three, three, and you came third. That's correct. That's right. Yeah, I remember Sam said that. All right. And he said he remembers the flugel player sound just coming over the top of the band in that whole hole that day. That was uh, Richard Duff. Uh, uh, yeah. It so, was a lovely player. Yeah, that performance. That was 1981, I believe, that performance. Oh, right. yeah. well, well, well. <laughs> uh, sticks in the mind. Um, the major was here for quite a while, um, and he years. obviously left a massive legacy with the band. During that time as well with him, you not only did contest performance, but you had many concerts, including a lot of TV work, um, which we don't get as much now, unfortunately, with brass bands. How was it doing TV to not only have the pressure of a performance, but then having to record it live for TV with the visual things that, that happens as well? Um, was that an added pressure? Well, believe it or no, Believe it or no, the way they rehearsed you in the studios and then you had to do that, as you know, the contest after it. By the time it come contest, you were relaxed. Mm -hmm. you, had, you were under the spotlight at first and then you... But by the end of that, I think I'm speaking for everyone, oh, you, you felt it. fairly relaxed. Oh, uh, uh, and yeah. about on the edge, you're still on the edge of your seat because you dare to do nothing like with that man. You know? The best of that brass was a perfect example. Oh, very much so. It became a thing that we were old hands at the game. Well, uh, no, no, the television thing. It's really quite sad that you lads don't get that. You don't get this TV job because mm -hmm. it was a big money spinner. Mm -hmm. uh, we made a lot of money. In fact, band and coast has nothing. Of course, you have to pay your way in band and now, nowadays, but I can safely say it never cost us any mm -hmm. in the days. No, well, the BBC paid your, your bus and your, your hotel. And it was down at Derby, at the mm -hmm. assembly rooms. Mm -hmm. And then when we did the fanfare in Glasgow, well, that was just along the road. But that, all that was paid for, and the band were paid for doing the jobs. Plus mm -hmm. the fact we got a prize money at the end of it. Of course, yeah. yeah. So all yeah. oh, changed. Oh, it was good times. Yeah. It was great exposure for the band. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The band was well known. They did on the show as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, me. And we did one with Jimmy Reid. What one was that we did with Jimmy Reid? I think that would be... Uh, was that Dougie Dorman, wasn't it? Dougie Dorman, sure. Of course it was, because uh, the union man was on the other union man, the miners, uh, Mick McGarkey. There was another religious program that used to get on a Sunday. Oh, I can't uh, remember the name of that. Well, that, that was well. uh, Harry Highway. Highway. Mm -hmm. That's right, Harry Seagull. Mm -hmm. Harry Seagull was a presenter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, in your time in the band, we have John and Bobby both played tuba, Alec, you played horn, Jimmy, you played euphonium. Um, you know, big instruments in the band, big sections, obviously the tubas, you know. The best. <laughs> Absolutely, being a tuba player myself. Um, 
How did you find that the parts that you had for your instrument developed over the time that you were in the band, from when you first started to when you came to the end of your career in the senior band? How did the writing for the band have changed? Certainly in the tubas, had it, it went a long way, or was it very much what you kind of expected? At the time we were, and for my, for me personally, at the time we were say in the park era, you didn't miss a rehearsal. You fell behind. Yeah. You had to be on the edge of your seat all the time. You had to be first sight me. The that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in my uh, experience, it was usually uh, Gilbert Winter stuff. Uh, the bands were playing but for a number of years. Yes, and uh, and that, some of that stuff was, was, was getting played for quite a long time after he died. Mm -hmm. But then there was a different uh, style of music coming in, which I think was to the, the good. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it was bringing in percussion, whereas before we'd only maybe a bass drum and a side drum and what have you, cymbals. But before that, there were no percussion allowed at all mm -hmm. when I started the contest with Waz. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's it, yeah. Uh, That's right, yeah. Well, that percussion made a big difference. Oh, well, it's well, it's it's kind of kind of a yeah. different colour entirely. <coughs> uh, and now we have percussionists oh, uh, writing test pieces for full band and, right, yes, yes. and they're an integral part yeah, of what we do now. Uh, Moving forward in the band's history, um, you've all stopped now playing in the senior band, but support the band still by listening, attending concerts and contests, but even more importantly, you are playing with the Heartlands Band, which brings together the youth players of today and your experience. So tell us how important that is for you and for the young people involved in that Pathway Band. Well, personally for me, I'm feeling that I'm getting to the end of a playing career actually, because uh, I've been at it for a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling you how long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> I'm not quite uh, but, uh, I'll still try and help the youngies out when it's possible, uh, if I'm still fit. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, well, it's not as big a commitment as we say we play with the senior band, mm -hmm. but when you're helping the kids, uh, you're hoping that the kids are going to progress to the senior band. And I would say, me, Bobby and Jimmy, that's the main reason we do it, mm -hmm. is that. But we wouldn't play with a lower section band just for the sake of playing with a lower section band. No, not at all. It, it's, it's there to help the kids and mm -hmm. no other reason than that, mm -hmm. and promote them. Yes. Because they, they take the, the, the principal chairs and mm -hmm. hopefully they're going to progress and do better things mm -hmm. for the band. And of course it means that you are still able to contest uh, no, we're still going even to at the 3rd and 4th section level. Um, so for, might be their first contest, but for you, you can guide them in the preparation and what it's like on the day. Well, it, it gives them the, the experience of sitting playing beside somebody, they know that's just going to sit there and play. And if they hear somebody else playing, they, they'll Play and it, it rubs off on them. And most of the kids do well when they're on the stage. It's certainly a fantastic uh, opportunity for the young people to sit next to the likes of yourselves um, and perform, but also for you to still play and, and be involved in the organisation and keep well, your you experience to yourself. You took them to a win yeah. in the Scottish. Right? Yeah, just above the board. Okay, <laughs> So how do you, back to the senior band, how do you see the band today in compared to when you played? What are the pieces like? What are the standards required to play like? What is the writing like now compared? Uh, what do you feel and what do you see when you see the band rehearsing or when you see them on the stage at the Albert Hall? Well, or? When, when I see them playing a piece like Fraternity that became set to the British Open, I can safely say, to my mind anyway, that. There are no weak chairs in the band. Every chair is a principal chair, really. They've got to play. And there can't be any weaknesses for playing a piece like that. And well, we didn't play at that level. But when you were playing, you evolved to these things. But we're not playing now, so <laughs> I would find it quite difficult to reach their levels now. Can you think of a performance that you've watched the senior band be involved in 
and it's made the hair stand on your arm. And many, many performances, oh, but the one I just mentioned, the mm -hmm. Fraternity, mm -hmm. I must say was, uh, for me, it was the finest performance any brass band ever I heard. Mm -hmm. It really was fantastic that day. There have been a few... We uh, feared nobody. We actually, mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the performance, Ali and I both says, I fear nobody the day. It was such a fine, fine performance. Mm -hmm. I think the standard of uh, compositions uh, the band's been asked to play these days is far more technical mm -hmm. than when we were playing. I'm saying that, but all this could, could uh, play technically too, but uh, I think it's more demanding nowadays mm -hmm. for, the all, for the whole lot of the band, every player. And certainly for what you played, Jimmy, on the end chair of the euphonium, oh, the, the oh. solos can go up oh, to the gods. Oh, mm. yeah, sky high, aye. Yes. Oh, aye. And they, and they write up there now on a quite oh, regular aye. basis oh, for aye. the mm. top bands. Oh, aye. Your nose bleeds up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in the bass section, where we may, years and years gone by, not have to be as technical, the parts wouldn't be as technical. Um, now they're very technical. Uh, all you know, verging towards you know, those technical euphonium parts would be normal. Uh, certainly, I can think of a few pieces which are really, really technical bass parts. Uh, and also the range. Yeah, I'm going to play up above the stave quite a lot. Um, so the bass parts have changed as well. But I would say in the last five to six years, uh, the way the band is playing, I would put that down to Nicholas Childs. Mm -hmm. oh, so Regardless who's taking the band, we mm -hmm. know we have other associate conductors in at times, but he's put a stamp on that. that that's, mm -hmm. that's where the bar is, and he, he's raised the bar again for the band and it, he's been nothing but good for the band I would say. Yeah. And like the Wendy's went back to pageantry. Mm. Now a lot of the bands felt that pageantry was wasn't difficult enough. But we heard and we knew how to play pageantry. And we weren't hearing pageantry at rehearsals. And uh, it took a lot of work for a lot of the bands, you know, to, to grasp what was required. And as Alex pointed out, if it hadn't been for the man in the middle, it would never have happened. Mm -hmm. just, just as I was saying earlier on, yeah, pageantry, nowadays it was classed as old hack. Mm -hmm. But uh, that proved to be a very, very musical piece of music. Absolutely, and it still oh, tests bands Oh, today. very much so, uh, So it, it was a very hard test, and mm -hmm. a very musical piece. Finally, can I get some sense of your best memories that you have? I know there must be a lot from being involved in Whitburn Band, whether it be the first one you remember, or one where you were sitting watching, or the one where the major took the band to this, or a TV performance. Or is there a couple, two or three, that you can think of, perhaps collectively, that you think they, they are the ones, the bookmarks I remember for these reasons across your careers? Well, the one that I remember, it really wasn't a contest, it was, a, it was like being at a, a contest. It was at Hexham Abbey, when we played the Enigma Variations, the whole thing. And the Major took us in that. That was quite a night, that. Mm -hmm. And then there were others where we accompanied John Wallace, the trumpet player, and Bucks and Zor Trumpet Concerto. Things like that were really, really, really good. There's a lot of contest performances, mm -hmm. but they were quite outstanding. Mm -hmm. And then the biggest thing of all is friendship. These guys that sit around me here, oh, we've right. been friends for 50 years, oh, that's right. and it, it lasts. Mm -hmm. I think that points to a lot of the success in the band, the camaraderie mm -hmm. and the friendship. It's like being in a different to your family, not just a friend, exactly. it's a family. Mm -hmm. And that's how the band has had success, because they looked after one another, we helped one another, and it's still going on yet, I can see. Well, I can see anyway. I think it was Kenny that once came away with that remark that we're, we're more like a family. Mm -hmm. You know, and this well, is... the, the thing about it is, when you're in the band, it's not about you, it's, the band comes first. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not about me, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about the whole collective thing in the band. That's what you've got to put first, and the people that's in the band. That's the most important. You can have the nicest band room, the nicest instruments, but you've got to have the people in the band. I'm afraid to me, banding is a disease <laughs> and a known, known cure. <laughs> <laughs> no. I never forget John 
<laughs> John one time said uh, his membership of the band was a condition of his marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the band comes first, that's it. <laughs> happen. And of course that continues today with so many families or couples, right. husband and wives and yeah. involved yeah. still right. in the band. Brothers. Yeah. Brothers. Uh, Brothers, yeah. of course. Oh, uh. in, in the tuba section and uh, and that and it's just uh, I think as, as a, a mainstay of Whitburn Band that that community of players and family of players that you've talked about when you joined the band is still the same thing today and the experience of the band has went on the pieces have got harder the players have changed but that focus is still mm -hmm. a core value of the ethos of Whitburn Band Very much so, yeah. so John Lambie, Bobby Henry, Alec Villar and Jimmy Graham, it's been a pleasure to speak to you this evening. Thank you very much indeed. And we look forward to seeing you at the next rehearsal. Thank you. Thank you.